sucking people's rights out of their brains through their social media platforms and redistributing that political sovereignty across the, the technocratic tier, um, that whole thing regards itself as, as essential to the survival of civilization and would much rather, as it has attempted to do and enjoyed some success in doing, would much rather um, destroy what's left of democracy than allow itself to be put out of power. The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we, don't we see still, them. to a large extent, live in the interregnum between between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. Jacob Siegel is a senior editor at Tablet. He is the co-host of the Podcast Manifesto, and I'm glad to talk to him today on June 1st, 2023, about his essay in Tablet entitled A Guide to Understanding the Hoax of the Century. I am hoping that uh, perhaps through this conversation, people will begin to get a glimmer of why I'm so focused on this particular issue. Um, to start with, I think I want to quote from your essay you wrote since 2016 the federal government has spent billions of dollars on turning the counter disinformation complex into one of the most powerful forces in the modern world a sprawling leviathan with tentacles reaching into both the public and private sector which the government uses to direct a whole of society effort that aims to seize total control over the internet and achieve nothing less than the eradication of human error your essay is not just a report on the Twitter files. It isn't just an examination of the policies of the Department of Homeland Security. It seems to sketch out a transformation in the whole of society. I would point out that the aim of the war on disinformation is not just to seize the Internet, but is also aimed at controlling all major media outlets and through the Restrict Act in America, aimed at controlling what minor media organizations will be allowed and what will be barred. How did you come to understand the significance and reach of fake news as a concept and uh, turn to the, the war on disinformation as, I think, one of the central themes of your essay and as something that spurred you to take a look at a transformation in society? Well, thanks for having me, Doug. I'm yeah. glad to be talking with you. Uh, mm -hmm. There are two, two sort of pivotal steps in the understanding of dis disinformation that led me to write that piece. The first was my experiences in Afghanistan as a military intelligence officer and just witnessing a form of information warfare there, a sort of burgeoning merger between big data forms of surveillance and social control and counterterrorism, which is what the, especially the second decade of the war in Afghanistan revolved around was really this uh, sort of grand project of big data power, social engineering and, uh, and targeting and counterterrorism and using big data and surveillance platforms and many of the same tools that are now operational you know, for advertisers, uh, predictive analysis markets, et cetera, that are now used. And then, in fact, were used for advertising then, but that had been uh, militarized or um, were being used in that way in Afghanistan. So it was having that basis um, combined with the sudden onslaught of talk about fake news and disinformation. So it just... It, you couldn't be in America in 2015 and 2016 or anywhere in the world that's plugged in to the you know, globalized American communications infrastructure. You couldn't be online or in America, that is, without noticing that all of a sudden fake news and then later disinformation had become the preeminent threats preoccupations, obsessions of the 
media class, the national security establishment, the thinking and chattering classes in the U.S. So it wasn't as if having already had a kind of background interest in and some understanding of this new nascent form of information warfare from Afghanistan, it wasn't as if I then had to go dig it out or excavate it from within the, you know, buried in archives in Langley or something like that. It was everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it was being uh, promoted. It was being sold as the greatest threat to humanity since terrorism, since, you know, Islamist terrorism. Uh, and it was, it, it seemed to revolve around all of these suppressed and unexamined assumptions about what fake news is, how fakeness was being determined, what news is for that matter in the modern media environment. And, and yet, despite having these glaring logical and philosophical and political gaps and inconsistencies that never slowed it down at all. If anything, it made it more powerful, more aerodynamic, perhaps removing the friction of needing to be sensible or coherent. It could just spread everywhere at once. And so simultaneously, you had this onslaught and it was perhaps the most unquestioned phenomenon I had ever witnessed. Um, there seemed to be very little genuine debate about it. The speed with which it uh, was accepted and then promoted to the preeminent threat of our time was astonishing. And then finally, there was one last dimension of it, which really struck me and, and made me feel I needed to study it more closely and in more depth. And that is the degree to which this new field of fake news study uh, which became, you know, the, the disinformation field or the counter disinformation field, as it were, the degree to which it seemed to harness every sector of society together, every leading, uh, powerful, sense making and uh, capital controlling sector of society together in a common cause in a way that I, I simply had never seen happen before even as a veteran of the war on terror and as somebody who'd been alive in America and, uh, you know, an adult after 2001, I had never seen anything like uh, the disinformation phenomenon in its ability to assemble virtually the entire NGO sector, all the leading academics, journalism as an institution in the leading uh, publications of journalism in their in their own um, right, all of them lining up behind this and uh, and essentially carrying it out as a great mission to the American people. And so having witnessed that, I, I just needed to look more closely at it. And that's what led to the writing of the piece. Now, I've listened to um, a few of your interviews on other podcasts, and you've been on Glenn Greenwald you're on unheard. Uh, you've been on, you know, you've been all over the place lately. So good, good for you. I'm really glad you're out there. But one of the things I've noticed that you have mentioned a few times is that it took you a while to gather all the pieces of this story and write this piece. It, you, you had attempted to a few years ago, and then finally it came together for you now. Um, when I think back on you know, the story you just told about how fake news arrived, it became, it went out everywhere. Um, I'm kind of struck uh, by my own failure to oppose it at the time as strongly as I might have, considering that I consider myself to be like a free speech absolutist. And somehow it just got past my radar that this was going to be a systematic uh, attack on free speech. Um, I don't know. There was something... It seemed rhetorical to me, maybe. I'm not sure. But what was it to put the pieces together for you so that you could write about it? And why do you think it didn't get debated even the way, like you mentioned, the war on terrorism got debated? I mean, after 9-11, the, uh, the consensus was formed very quickly that there needed to be a military response to the attacks. But there were organizations, I was one of them, that was calling for some sort of judicial or legal response, you know, an investigation, 
treating this as a criminal act rather than a, an actual war. I'm not sure that I could justify that in a debate today, but but the the point is that there was room for dissent after the attacks of 9-11, and this didn't seem to, there were no pockets of dissent that were expressed, I mean, maybe in your own head. Anyway, what was it the Twitter files that but brought it into focus for you, or what, what shaped it? The Twitter files gave me uh, sort of the narrative means to do it. I, it. You know, I had struggled, like you're saying, for a few years at a number of drafts, most of which survive in the current piece. So it's not as if I had to start from scratch. It was just I couldn't bring it all together. And, um, and I'm a writer, not a talker. So mm -hmm. I appreciate all these invitations to do interviews. And I'm, I'm happy to talk, especially to somebody like yourself who – who I, you know, I find smart and interesting. Um, but when I write something, it's how I am thinking through it and understanding it for myself. And the purest form of my thought and understanding is what exists in writing. So, you know, sometimes it's funny. I do all these interviews and I worry that I'm undoing the work of the writing because I have a mm -hmm. tendency to rant and ramble and, uh, <laughs> And mm -hmm. so it, part of the reason it took so long is that it's complicated and mysterious and deliberately obscuritanist and enigmatic. And it, it was constructed in order to deceive and beleaguer you. That's the point of the information wars, to prevent you from thinking clearly and to manipulate you. And so if you are struggling against that manipulation and then struggling, in fact, to get beyond that manipulation, it makes sense that it's going to be difficult. It's There's a vast apparatus arrayed precisely against that goal of, of a person thinking clearly. So in that sense, it, it makes sense. But it's the way that I get to the clarity or whatever um, small doses of clarity I'm capable of is through the writing. So that's part of it. Another, another thing to bring up here is that, you know, in the immediate aftermath, Trump was so sort of devastating to the psyche of the American, I think both the American ruling class, but also the sort of, um, like, you know, what you might call the centrist liberal establishment and even center left establishment. It was so, there was so much um, maximalism. There was so much apocalypticism and the rhetoric around Trump, it became very difficult for people to acknowledge that anything might be wrong on the other side. And, and this, anything might be wrong, in other words, in the, on the anti-Trump resistance side. And yeah, there were a mm -hmm. few people pointing out that uh, there were problems with the resistance early on, but by and large, to do so was to associate oneself with Trumpism, which was, you know, it seemed to be a lethal act in many professional uh, social circles. Um, and so there was a real, I think, internal difficulty that a lot of people had in doing that. And I'm talking about, you know, maybe well-meaning, not hyper-ideological people who, you know, voted for Democrats and were liberal, but were not, were capable of reasoning independently prior to Trumpism. Trumpism was this kind of singularity that made it so that that sort of thinking had now become suspect and and was to put oneself in. And of course, there's a whole broader ideological movement prior to Trumpism that had been pushing towards that sort of maximalism and, and these sorts of purity tests that if you have any deviation from a party orthodoxy, that means you're a fascist or entirely on the other side. And Trumpism was the sort of culmination of that, the apotheosis of that that's part of it. Finally, the the nature of an information war, like the one that's been waged over the past decade and which is not over, uh, which continues in the present, is um, to be particularly this information war, this whole of society information operation that began more or less in the response to Trumpism, aims at capturing the framework of reality. Um, so it, it does not posit itself as a uh, an event inside of the social order, which can be debated on its own terms, like the war against terrorism. Mm 
for instance. <clears throat> Yeah, you know, this goes beyond that. It seeks to posits itself as being outside of that sort of political or or ideological or even phenomenological horizon, because it says that um, this is simply about stabilizing the environment in which the political events occur. Right. So it it simultaneously is fully immersive. And you can think of that sort of in practical terms in the way that it attempts to control the media environment in toto. Right. So that's part of it. And at the same time, um, as it's trying to do that, it presents itself as a field, as a, a sort of scientific discipline. Right. That it has this sort of technocratic aspect whereby it becomes the architecture of the social order rather than, uh, or, or it presents itself and seeks to become the architecture of the social order in which debate occurs, thereby exempting itself from that debate. And, uh, you know, of course, there's a, a, a literature on this that you're familiar with, uh, Frankfurt School theorists who who dealt with some of these same issues and other um, other 20th century thinkers. But I think that that makes it difficult to talk about insofar as it's successful. It becomes difficult to talk about because it really does sort of capture the framing of the conversation. And it also becomes difficult to talk about because you have to talk about everything at once. It, it links all events together um, because it's uh, capturing the sense-making apparatus in this way, everything becomes part of it. You know, you're, you are the fish inside the tank who is trying to describe the fish bowl, and that's a difficult task. Um, so all of those things created this sort of singularity. Yeah, Let, <clears throat> let's walk through a, a little bit just what we know, what, what you know, what you've written about in your piece about the war on disinformation. I mean, the the extent to it. I mean, obviously, we're not going to be able to cover the full extent of it because it, it is everywhere. It's in the EU. It's it's in Canada. It's in the United States. It's in multiple nonprofit organizations and uh, government agencies and intelligence agencies and so on. But how like would you put the Department of Homeland Security at the center of of this story, or where would you start if you were going to tell someone what's happening or what's happened? Department of Homeland Security is a good place to start. Uh, mm -hmm. CISA, mm -hmm. the uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, um, also the the State Department's Global Engagement Center. That's the, the real sort of ground zero is the GEC, the Global Engagement Center, which is launched in 2016 as the original federal counter disinformation agency by President then President Obama, and which grows out of a uh, previous State Department Global Engagement Center, which had a, a, a Basically, it's the same agency, but its original name was, I think it's the Counter Strategic Messaging Agency, something along those lines. It was a counterterrorism agency inside the State Department headed by this former Navy SEAL named Michael Lumpkin, um, which had a mission to counter jihadist messaging online, mm -hmm. specifically ISIS messaging. And as you'll recall, in 2013, 2014, there was this intense fascination with the ISIS social media messaging campaign. And ISIS seemed to be this new kind of jihadi organization that was capturing the world's attention, attracting new recruits from Europe and, and uh, Muslim countries, in part due, in part, of course, due to its successes, uh, putative successes in Syria and Iraq and capturing territory and, and uh, marching towards the reinstantiation of the caliphate, but also because it had this very deliberate, lurid, um, spectacular, in a way, social media presence where it was simultaneously unbelievably brutal and showing off beheadings and also kind of hyper real, this hyper saturated aspect to it. And so it really captured people's attention and, um, it sort of launched the whole cottage industry of counter messaging efforts, 
the premier uh, effort in that regard was this one inside the State Department. So that then grows into the Global Engagement Center, which Obama designates as the, and it's the same head, Michael Lumpkin, the former Navy SEAL, who heads it, um, who then leads the burgeoning counter disinformation effort inside the United States. Important to point this out because it shows in institutional terms the direct continuity between the war on terror and the U.S. counterterrorism establishment and the counter disinformation establishment. Now, for interesting reasons, as you pointed out, there was real debate about uh, the war on terror and counterterrorism <laughs> as a strategy. And much of that, much of the dissent from counterterrorism as a, a strategy came from progressives and people in the nonprofit world. And, and yet, when this transformation occurs, when it goes from counterterrorism to the uh, Global Engagement Center devoted to counter disinformation, the, that um, dissension disappears almost entirely. And the nonprofit world falls completely in line in very, it, very rapidly. And some of that has to do with the singular quality of Trump, but it also has to do with the fact that from the very beginning, the Global Engagement Center um, takes as its mandate and its mission to, to lead a whole of society effort, as it refers to it. And that means that it's from the very beginning seeking to bring in under a, a common cause and in a common uh, coordination and organizational structure, tech companies, nonprofits, um, other private entities. This is uh, part of its vision from the very beginning is telling, and, it, and indeed it, it's very effective in doing that. Um, but that's really, I would say, where to begin is with the global engagement. So I don't know, you can go back a little further if you're trying to dig into the sort of the the underpinning in terms of the ideas that animate all of this, but politically, institutionally, it's uh, Obama's decision at the end of his term in office, right as Trump is coming in to sign into law, this countering foreign disinformation act, mm -hmm. um, which is part of the 2017 national defense authorization bill and establishes the governmental and budgeting basis for the Global Engagement Center and for what is going to rapidly expand into this whole of society effort against disinformation. So, and that uh, was sparked by the concerns around Trump's collusion with Russia. Is that right? It was the, or the Russian um, attempt to, uh, influence the 2016 election. That that's what brought that into being. That, that closure. Well, I mean, it's telling that you you name both of those, right? You say just uh, it's telling in the sense that that they were deliberately elided. Like, was it brought into being because Trump was colluding with Vladimir Putin, or because Russia? in some broader but less targeted sense had interfered in the election, but not necessarily on Trump's behalf. Those are actually two very different assertions, the latter of which that Russia interfered in the election would be not at all uncommon. We know Russia interferes in elections. We interfere in elections. Many mm -hmm. countries interfere in elections. Now, perhaps there was some increase or, or significant difference in the qualitative or quantitative uh, aspect of the interference, but it wouldn't be a surprise that Russia was interfering. On the other hand, if an American presidential candidate, if an, uh, an American president was working together with the Russians, well, that would be that would be really something quite new and and alarming. And yet, in the the sort of nascent stage of this counter disinformation, this war against disinformation, all of this stuff was thrown out. You know, and then it, you just could elide these differences. It didn't matter. You just throw everything against the wall and mm -hmm. see what sticks. So the answer is yes and yes. <laughs> Neither of these assertions ever had to be proved, of course. And in fact, they've subsequently been comprehensively disproved. Both of those assertions have been comprehensively disproved. Um, 
Not that Russia didn't interfere at all. Russia did interfere in the 2016 election, just uh, not to any great effect. It was, you know, that no one has ever substantively demonstrated that either the Russian trolling or the Russian ad purchases or the influence, influence operations online had any significant effect whatsoever on voters in the United States. But all of this stuff was thrown out. It was mm-hmm. thrown out through this uh, new messaging apparatus that had been under construction actually for some years as part of the Obama administration and had been um, used at various points previous to uh, Trump's rise, like during the selling of the Iran deal. And this new messaging and communications apparatus was one in which there were targeted leaks to journalists. Those targeted leaks could then be fed back into U.S. intelligence agencies, which were then fed back into journalism. So in other words, you could take an unproved assertion You could leak that unproved assertion. You could have an intelligence official leak that unproved assertion to a journalist who would then credulously report on it as if it were fact. And in fact, you could leak it to multiple journalists. So you could leak it to a journalist at The Washington Post and at The New York Times. And then it appears as if there are multiple intelligence officials saying the same thing, when in fact it's the same intelligence sources leaking the same story to their their chosen reporters at the two institutions. Then those stories get printed in the publications and those articles then get cited in future congressional actions or in future um, intelligence uh, actions, including FISA warrants potentially, which can then subsequently in turn be reported on by the press, giving all of this the appearance of a kind of solidity and substantiality that it doesn't actually have. So that that the, the, that sort of provided the rhetorical and the, and the narrative foundation, these constant uh, series of leaks about Russian collusion, Russia uh, you know interfering on on Trump's behalf, there was this churn, all throughout 2016, this had been happening. And as we now know, much of this was directed by the Clinton campaign mm-hmm. and came from uh, Perkins Coy and from Fusion GPS, the law firm and an oppo uh, sort of private espionage firm working with the Clinton campaign and from intelligence officials who were in some sense pro-Clinton, but I think more fundamentally anti-Trump and who viewed Trump as a sort of existential threat to their institutional position and who also, I think, probably viewed Trump. You know, I take them at their word that many of these people, like Peter Strzok, the FBI agent who was uh, you know, later forced to resign and, and who was leading the investigation into Trump while also uh, texting his mistress who he was having an affair with about how he w- they were going to stop Trump from getting elected. They would never allow something like this to happen. <laughs> I think a guy like Strzok is not just thinking Trump is a threat because he's going to go after the FBI and take my budget away. I think he probably sincerely thinks Trump is a threat to liberal civilization. But mm-hmm. of course, you know, in the way that uh, ideolo- ideology and, and class interest work, they're the same thing. It's like, you know, his self-interest and his view of what constitutes an existential threat are not, these are not pure abstractions that can be separated out. So, Mm -hmm. sorry. So to, to to just wrap it up, you have all of that going on. You have this churn going on in 2016 where all of these stories about Trump and Russia are, are being thrown out. And that culminates with the, uh, the final act from, John Brennan, the Obama appointed CIA chief, who presides over the publication of the the ICA, uh, Intelligence Community Assessment, which is supposed to be a reflection of the kind of consensus opinion among the 17, I forget how many we're up to now, the more than a dozen different intelligence agencies. So an ICA is supposed to not only sort of even out for Uh, perhaps political or regional biases among the different intelligence agencies. It's also supposed to even out for institutional biases. So that's what it's supposed to be. But in fact, 
the document that gets produced under Brennan is one that he personally presides over, where he excludes contrary opinion in order to produce a document that alleges that Putin had interfered in the election specifically to help Trump. Mm -hmm. (coughs) Excuse me. Mm -hmm. And as we now know from subsequent House investigations from uh, people like Mike Pompeo talking about this later, Brennan not only excluded contrary opinion, including from Russia experts in the intelligence community who said that Putin actually preferred Clinton, Mm -hmm. he also vetoed objections to including the Steele dossier. And, and included the Steele dossier as part of this report. So that is what ultimately provides the, the real sort of basis for the claim that there is a legitimate, uh, legitimate intelligence community belief that Russia interfered in the election and that Russia interfered to help Donald Trump get elected. Right. So. I want to point out that this is why when people on the left, people in my milieu, um, uh, refuse to acknowledge the significance of the Durham report and the significance that Russiagate was a hoax, um, I get uh, upset because it it was the the key. It was the starting point that those claims were what justified the uh, the expansion of and the creation of this war on disinformation, the creation of all these institutions that are intervening in the media landscape and probably beyond that. What one of the things I wanted to get to, I've written I'd written these um, questions ahead of time and I haven't asked but one yet. So one thing you wrote was that the war on disinformation uh, has to be thought of. Uh, on a level that goes beyond a critique of the media. Um, You wrote, the American press, once a guardian of democracy, was hollowed out to the point that it could be worn like a hand puppet by the U.S. security agencies and party operatives. So what that means is when you're critiquing the media, you're not, you shouldn't think of it as just, you know, oh, well, journalism today has gone to hell in a handbasket or corporate media hacks are, are deplorable or anything like that. But but um, but you should think of it in terms of politics as well. How uh, what do you think is happening politically um, to necessitate in the minds of these in, uh, intelligence agencies or in the minds of Obama um, this transformation of the whole of society? What 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 does what is the next level? Yeah, I think that we have a technocratic ruling party in the United States that will not. Uh, stand by and allow anybody from outside that ruling party power on the national level. It's, it is, um, it is effectively on the national stage. The U S is effectively a one party state. Now Mm -hmm. that's being contested. Of course, it's, it's incomplete. It hasn't reached the point of real open violence yet, but the whole point of this counter disinformation architecture is precisely to preempt the need for violence um, in order to achieve the same effect, which is to preserve the monopoly on power held by the technocratic ruling party. And um, that is the basis for viewing populist movements, legitimately democratic, uh, you know, legitimately elected figures like Donald Trump, whatever your objections to him, Mm -hmm. um, that is the basis for viewing somebody like him and Bernie Sanders, I should say. I mean, people on the the people on the left you're describing ought to be aware of the fact that many of these same tactics were used against Bernie Sanders. It never had to um, go uh, where it went with Donald Trump because he was picked off much more easily with the help of the the Democratic Party, of course. But um, you know, the, the the same accusations about Russian collusion, the same attempts to depict all of his supporters as extremists or illiberal in some way, the same uh, efforts by people inside the federal agencies to, to stymie and trip him up in various ways occurred. So um, 
and who knows where they would have gone if if he had gotten elected. But in any event, um, that's the that's the 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 reason why this happened. It happened because um, the members of this ruling party, and I specify technocratic because I think that speaks to their ideological orientation. I don't, you know, it's not, um, they're mostly Democrats, but they're not really left necessarily in any meaningful sense, meaningful sense. They're also not right in any meaningful sense. They're, they are uh, oriented towards a belief in expertise in technical expertise in engineering solutions to human problems and and in a general contempt for individual human reason and the ability of individuals to reason their way to their own solutions to their political problems and to organize their lives uh, so the the basic premise in all of this is that you know, people can't be trusted with their own minds. They do dangerous things like vote for Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders or um, refuse to take lockdowns because they, or refuse to take vaccines because they already have natural immunity or support the withdrawal from Afghanistan or, or criticize the withdrawal from Afghanistan or support the war in Ukraine or whatever they do fundamentally untrustworthy things that are then presented as existential threats to the rest of the society. And so in order to mitigate against those threats, which now occur online where people are supposedly susceptible to this constant onslaught of disinformation, it's necessary to take uh, for that technocratic ruling party to take complete control, um, not over the means of production, but over the, the means of communication, social and political discourse. And that's what they have attempted to do with considerable success up until this point. Some setbacks, but considerable success. Yeah. Um, since Trump was elected, we've seen a merger between the neoconservative <clears throat> Republicans, the never Trumpers and um, the kind of center of the Democratic Party. Um, and yet weird things happen, like Fukuyama seemed to be endorsing Bernie Sanders at one point, uh, or you know, at least kind of gesturing in that direction. But would you say that this non-ideological, uh, technocratic perspective is more important, kind of trumps um, uh, whatever political commitments you might have along the lines of, oh, I'm a neoconservative, I'm a neoliberal, I, I'm hawkish, I'm a dove, that kind of thing. The, the and more important is, do you believe in the power of expert knowledge and rational uh, elite uh, opinion? Is that basically what's at the center? Yes, but uh, the expert opinion and... Uh, rational technocracy, as it were, also has, uh, you know, a profit motive, of course. And so mm -hmm. it pursues basically the promotion of expert opinion requires or revolves around the constant acquisition of new sources of sinecure and wealth for the expert class also. So, um, so that's, that provides the additional political basis more than any political philosophy per se. So like, you know, you see this convergence on Ukraine, for instance, and without getting into too much of the politics of Ukraine, because I think that the, the politics of the war between Russia and Ukraine from inside of Ukraine are mm -hmm a world apart from the conversation about Ukraine and the interest in Ukraine from inside the United States. So mm -hmm. without uh, questioning, you know, Ukraine's uh, right to defend itself against an invasion, the support for Ukraine inside of the U.S. is not simply a matter of um, expertise or technocracy per se, because you could point out, like, 
Well, why is it more? Why is it the more correct technocratic opinion to support Ukraine rather than Russia, rather than abstention? You know, it's mm-hmm. it's not one is not necessarily uh, more intrinsically rational or technocratic, but functionally speaking, in application, the technocratic answer is the one that benefits the technocrats and the administrators and the uh, defense industry and the whole complex of which they're all a part, which of course is precisely what you know Eisenhower was warning about in his famous address was not simply arms manufacturers. It was this scientific military uh, superstructure being built up. Mm. And, and so that I think is the kind of additional layer. It's, you know, it's, Class interest, you could say, essentially. Um, But there are philosophical presuppositions and beliefs baked in that are not unimportant. You know, the idea that there is an engineering solution to every problem is a real article of faith. I don't mean to count that out. And so it's only, you know, I don't think that it's only material interest. I think the ideas are very important. But where you uh, where you find a lack of one, it gets filled in by the other. Yeah, um, I saw. Uh, I've been following uh, Matt Taibbi's podcast and then uh, his Twitter feed, and he linked out to an article that confirmed something that Walter Kern had said that he worried about, which was that the um, disinformation war, the the uh, uh, you know the uh, censorship industrial complex, may be too big to fail at this point. And, and apparently an article of last year in the Harvard Review actually was like headlined disinformation uh, discipline too big to fail. And the, they've, been, they've spent like billions of dollars uh, on yeah. this. It, uh, yeah, right. I, mean, I, I, I think potentially hundreds of billions of dollars. We don't know. Right. Right. It's very hard to say. I've been trying to get an accurate number for almost two years. I think mm-hmm. at the very, the very, very least, tens of billions of dollars. And I think right. much more likely hundreds of billions of dollars. Right. Uh, and, and the, the, so there's a whole, there's a whole new field of academic study around disinformation that's being formed. There are many different NGOs and nonprofits that are, uh, applying for grants and his whole existence is based on disinformation. Um, you know, uh, people, there's some people talk about an overproduction of elites and that we have an overproduction of elites in society and we have to figure out what to do with them. This would be a way to give them something to do, right? <laughs> a big, huge industrial censorship uh, complex. Um, so I do feel up against the wall as I try to uh, take it on. But um, but I also feel like it's clearly the thing to do. What, you know, we we reached about forty two minutes. Um, what I want to do now is talk about uh, so because we only have a little bit longer. Um, talk about the reaction. This will be for patrons. Like, how have you? How has your your essay been taken up? How? What do you think of the reaction to the Twitter files? Uh, and um, overall, how where have you found political allies and where have you found the most resistance? So we'll talk about that in the Patreon. If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both. 